why are we barreling towards a new world conflict? You know I talk about interest rates a lot, but there's more going on here in this market right now than just interest rates, than just our economy. Our support for Ukraine will not waver. NATO will not be divided, and we will not tire. There's a lot of fear out there right now as Biden traveled to Ukraine to hand deliver that half billion dollar check and Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, threw around some pretty stunning rhetoric, some stunning and and I would argue dangerous language about a coming world war. I'll tell you, if we are not careful, if we're not careful, these guys are all going to drag us into some kind of expensive and deadly forever proxy war that will cost us billions of dollars or quite possibly World War III. Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that there will be major consequences for China if they decide to send weapons to Russia. Well, China is sitting down with Vladimir Putin to to try and work something out. What are they trying to work out? Uh, And can I just say for one moment here, can can I channel the left and, and say what they always say, which is that words have meaning. And, and that's apparently why, you know, of course, you, you can't call a, a biological man that, that feels like a woman a he. And, and that's why you can't say pregnant women. You, you have to say pregnant people because you're going to upset someone because these words matter. Well, okay, if words matter, then can someone get the message to Zelensky and Blinken and Joe Biden? right now and just tell them to stop talking and to cool it because this is a tinderbox. And I worry that they're going to launch us into something that we really don't want to be in. Trust me, no amount of green energy initiatives from them are going to save us from any of it. We're going to discuss. Plus, as fentanyl use spikes in all use, why aren't we patrolling our own border, right? I mean, you're, you're out there right now making sure that that Ukraine is, well, not exactly safe, but protected by us. And yet we've got a situation going on here with with a drug trade that's making billions of dollars for these Mexican drug cartels. And according to the DEA, much of this fentanyl is actually coming from China. You got to look at history here and ask the question whether or not this is a little bit of payback those opium wars of the 1800s we're going to discuss. Meanwhile, a Chinese company suddenly wants to do a joint venture with Ford. Interesting. For an electric vehicle plant in Michigan, does no one understand how bad it would be if we were to become reliant even more than we already are on China? Ford's like this giant, happy-go-lucky golden retriever out there saying, oh, great, you know, money. It's a big payout. It's like a a pepperoni treat for Ford and for shareholders. And the U.S. government doesn't get it. There's no one there thinking about long-term consequences. No one but China anyway. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is the Trish Regan Show. I'm Trish. Portions of today's show are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. I'll tell you, if you're worried about the world, this is probably something you should be looking at. 1-866-589-0560. Again, 1-866-589-0560. You can give them a call. LegacyPMInvestments.com for your free investing guide. Anyway, I'm going to start here with comments from Ukraine's president. He was speaking to the German newspaper, Die Welt, and Mr. Zelensky basically issued this warning to China. I'm going to quote for you. He said, it is important that China does not support the Russian Federation in this war, because if China allies itself with Russia, there will be a world war. And I do think that China is aware of that. Wow. Okay, so this is kind of turning into what you might call a serious proxy war. And you need to ask why. I mean, consider this. Just look at the numbers. Since Russia's invasion on February 24, 2022, basically a year ago, the U.S. has pledged nearly $200 billion in assistance to Ukraine. This is real money. This is for the Wall Street Journal. So that's money that's been going to weapons, ammunition, long-range missiles, tanks. Meanwhile, Chinese companies, they're out there aiding Russia's military with navigation equipment, jamming technology, fighter jet parts. What happened to our diplomatic channels? 
How did this get eroded so quickly under Joe Biden? It seems there's no willingness to engage any of these diplomatic efforts. Tulsi Gabbard, by the way, remember she warned of this. She was one of the first ones to warn of this because she said there's a desire on um, the part of the elites for basically a big payday within this industry of weapons, tanks, et cetera. And you know me, I'm all for supporting military efforts when we need to be supporting them, but I also want to be thoughtful about when, in fact, we deploy capital, money for weapons. We also need to recognize these financial realities, which is that our country's suffering and inflation is way through the roof and it's not getting any better. And we need money for our future, which is why I suspect support for this conflict in Ukraine has fallen so significantly and so quickly. And I want to share this with you because according to an NPR poll, when this whole thing first broke out just about a year ago, 60% of Americans, they supported sending weapons to Ukraine. Well, now just 48% support it. And soon I suspect it will be even lower, which may be why Biden traveled all the way over there trying to drum up support in the media. I mean, the media covered it. Like you'd think the guy was James Bond. <laughs> Joe Biden, the new James Bond, all the headlines. Let me go through them. Here we go. Uh, AP said, how do you sneak a president into a war zone without anyone noticing? (laughs) Then you've got cloak and dagger moves, a company rare presidential visit to Ukraine from the Washington Post and inside Biden's surreal and secretive journey to Ukraine. That's the New York Times. (laughs) So really, uh, he's, he's like some kind of super spy. But the saddest thing here, and this is what really gets me, is that This is real, and people are dying. And if you don't have the protection of a Biden or a Zelensky, you're going to die over there in Ukraine. So many lives have been taken, are being taken. And the American taxpayer is footing the bill for all this violence. Again, don't get me wrong. I mean, I am a big believer in doing what needs to be done, but how the heck is this still going on, especially when we get reports of Russia's military being so horribly, horribly weak. If it's so horribly weak, why are we still in this? General Mark Milley, he's estimated that since November, 100,000 soldiers have been killed on both sides, each side, and as many as 40,000 civilians have also died. You know, we just got out of a proxy war, did we not? In Afghanistan, which by the way, the whole departure was absolutely shameful. And now here we are in a new war. No one wins these guys. No one wins in any of these scenarios. And everyday Americans lose out because we don't have the money for it. We can't keep writing blank checks with no oversights, no goals. Even the mainstream media is starting to question it. USA Today out with an article writing about just exactly where is all this money going? (laughs) Let's just say Ukraine is not exactly known for being straight-laced. They have historically been pretty corrupt. I mean, the corruption rates have been off the charts, and yet we are still cutting these checks. And Joe Biden is hand-delivering them another half billion dollars. So let's put this in perspective. Let's try and understand really and truly how much money this is. According to the special inspector who has overseen aid to Afghanistan since 2012, we've spent $113 billion. Now, he said That is approximately almost as much as we spent in 20 years for Afghanistan. So in one year, think about that. In one year, we have spent, according to the the guy who oversaw all this, almost as much as we spent during 20 years in Afghanistan. I mean, fortunately, we don't actually have boots on the ground. But who knows with this crew, really and truly. As I said earlier, meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal is, is reporting a higher number, 200 $200 $200 billion is what they're quoting, which would mean we've spent more in one year in Ukraine than we've spent, what, during our 20 years in Afghanistan? We, we cannot afford another never-ending war. We really can't. The costs are too high. They're not something that you and, and me and everyday Americans can really manage. Taxpayers can't handle this, for goodness sakes. We, we got all kinds of problems of our own. And we ought to be going through diplomatic channels, but we're not. We're not, because apparently this is like the go-to move. The government is printing money to help Ukraine defend itself 
they're against Vladimir Putin. But our government isn't really doing anything, anything at all, to actually protect our border here at home. So you got to kind of just appreciate the irony of it. I mean, you can't do both. No, we're just focused on Ukraine, nothing here. Look, these drug cartels, they're smuggling so much fentanyl into this country, reportedly enough to kill every American 20 times over. More than 70,000 Americans are dying from opioid overdoses in, in the most recent numbers. They, they've likely skyrocketed from what we've most recently seen. And according to the DEA, China remains the primary source of fentanyl and fentanyl-related substances that are trafficked into the U.S., You know, China has had its own struggle with opioids, don't forget. A significant, significant struggle, and they actually blame it on the West. They're very, very sensitive about all this over there. China began the use of opium back in the 7th century. It was for medical use, but then by the 1800s, it got out of control. It became very, very widespread, and that was when the Chinese began mixing opium with tobacco, and it became pretty recreational. And all of a sudden, the West recognized that this could be a pretty big business. And so before you knew it, you had big British companies that were packaging this stuff and selling this stuff, and it was a huge, huge trade. Interestingly, again, you you know I'm a student of history, and I like to look at history as a guide to the present and to the future. Interestingly, guess what? The government in Beijing, the Xing Dynasty, They couldn't manage their border in the South. And so all this opioid drug stuff kept coming over. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it, right? Consequently, as all this demand grew, the British opium companies continued their supplies and more and more Chinese began smoking opium recreationally, more and more became addicted. It became a very, very bad time. And so China recognized that, and they tried to crack down on the opium use. And so they tried to crack down on Britain selling all this stuff. This would have been the Xing Dynasty. And the British said, no, 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 this is free trade. The traders ought to be able to go in there and sell this. Well, the Chinese, they decided that they were going to threaten and indeed punish opium merchants with the death penalty. So they were trying really hard to get this under control. But their border was a mess, and the Brits were selling this stuff to their people. And people were dying because of these addictions. Now, keep in mind, opium was Britain's most profitable commodity. I mean, it's amazing. It was a huge business for the Europeans. And the Chinese would argue that it was at their expense. Now, it happened again in 1856. And this time, it was the British and the French empires against the Xing Dynasty of China. Again, uh, another war, effectively. They had the first opium war, and then they had the second opium war. Germany got involved. The U.S. got involved right around 1960, which would have been just before the start, just to give you a sense of where you are, just before the start of the Civil War. Now, China agreed back then to a series of treaties, which people in China still kind of cringe about, because these were known as the unequal treaties. and It became the century of humiliation, just a really bad hundred years. And the Communist Party actually used this. This was very central to their message in terms of trying to galvanize people for this nationalistic message that, you know, we all needed to come together in this communist society. To this day, the opium wars and that lost 100 years they are a very sore subject there in China. And many, many people still blame the West for having benefited so significantly from that trade and introducing in a more commercial way those opioids to their society. Again, like they had been there, but somebody figured out how to make money on it, just like those Mexican drug cartels who have figured out how to make a ton of money off of fentanyl, which, as I said, the DEA said, the most of which is originating from China. So it's kind of like a a reversal of history in some ways, if you would. You know, NPR had a piece this week, and this is what, what sparked my interest, because they said, could we actually start to see real wars around these drugs? And they were referencing the drugs coming in from Mexico, and whether or not, you know, we talk about the war on drugs, whether it might actually lead to a real war, which 
brought me to that whole opium crisis back in the 1860s. The two opium wars, in some ways, it's like this weird progression of history where we're kind of back where we started, but now the U.S. is on the receiving end of getting all this bad stuff into the country, which the, the Chinese, according to the DEA, have a hand in by supplying Mexico with these poisonous drugs, with these drugs that are killing so many Americans. And so like the Xing dynasty in Beijing in the 1800s, Washington can't stop it. I should at least point out that at least the Xing dynasty actually tried to. I'm not convinced the Biden administration really has any interest. This week, we're getting a little bit more lip service out of both sides. They seem to be, you know, suggesting it is a problem that they can work on together. I don't buy it. You know, the vice president of the United States assigned to manage our border crisis won't even actually really go there. Right. Because reality has been so distorted, distorted by a leftist party that's so power hungry that they, they have changed the story to somehow say that it's inhumane to enforce your border. Well, I'll tell you what's inhumane. It's inhumane to allow this drug trade to continue flourishing. And we don't want the United States to have 100 years of humiliation because a population becomes addicted, much like China had in the 1800s. Speaking of China, we run some serious risks at this moment of time, in time, of becoming increasingly more dependent on China. There's a big deal that they're trying to get through between Ford and a major Chinese company because they think it's going to result in more jobs in Michigan. I can tell you, it's going to result in more problems for the United States. But before we do that, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our great advertisers right here on the Trish Regan Show. This is from Key City Capital. We all know our dollars are not going as far as they used to, and that's probably going to continue for a while. Well, the team over at Key City Capital wants you to think about how you're investing And they believe they can help you offset some of the negative impacts of this inflationary environment. You can check them out at keycitycapital.com forward slash Trish. It's for accredited investors only. But for those investors, Key City says they have some ideas on how you can generate cash flow, passive investments in cash flowing real estate, which may act as a hedge against some of this inflation and some of the stock market volatility. And that's because... They point out that when prices rise, more couples, more families delay home ownership. And since Key City Capital has thousands of rental units, they believe that there are some attractive prospects for income and appreciation as more and more renters apply to live in their communities. So consider letting the team at Key City Capital, a sponsor of the Trish Regan Show, help you try to grow and diversify your wealth and your portfolio in these challenging times. For more information about whether Key City Capital is the right approach for you, go to keycitycapital.com forward slash Trish or call them directly. You can call them at 1-817-912-1569. Again, it's 817-912-1569. Remember, remember, investing comes with all kinds of risk. And I I always want to make that very, very clear. So you've got to understand what you're getting into. You've got to consult your own advisors before investing in any products. And I am definitely not your financial advisor, although I have a lot of macro views, as you know, on things. But let me turn back to China right now and the inroads that it's trying to make here in the U.S. The question is whether history is repeating itself in new ways. We talked about what's going on at the border and how that once happened in China in a very similar way, also with opioids. Well, let's talk about what's going on from a, a business standpoint. You know, some might actually say this is a kind of payback. It, it, you know, the, the economic and national security strategies are very interesting here because at present the Chinese, the Chinese want to do this deal with an American car company, Ford. They want to have their company, CATL, it's like number one in battery production. They want their company to partner up with Ford. Ford wants this, by the way. Like, Ford's all in. It's a a three-and-a-half or $3.4 billion deal. And they want it to happen, and they think that this would be great because then we'll have more batteries that we're making here in the U.S. Except that, except that, there's there's a little asterisk here. You're using Chinese technology. So you may be making them here, but you're using all this technology, creating even more reliance on China. 
for us in the future. Look, I know Joe Biden. He loves EVs. And I'll tell you, I, by the way, so long as Elon Musk isn't making them right. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Elon Musk deserves a heck of a lot of credit because that guy was the visionary who was out there in front of everyone from the very, very beginning and single-handedly, I'd say, pretty much created this industry. But Biden wants this to happen. I think at some point it'll happen. I, I don't think it's going to happen as soon as he would like and some on the left would like, but it's real. And we are starting to see more people look for these EVs. And as such, you're going to need to increase your production of batteries here in the U.S. You cannot be rely on China, reliant on China. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, you want to be reliant on China for those cheap batteries? Kind of like we had to rely on the Middle East for oil? I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, right? Because we can actually make those batteries here. Whereas the oil, you have to get out of the ground. But yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. I, I'm a free market capitalist, you know that. But it's not perfect. And this is where government has to come in and protect people for too long, far too long in the name of free market capitalism. We focused on this whole idea that everyone could make money. We could improve national security through mutual interests and uh, everything would be hunky-dory but that didn't work didn't work out at all it's certainly not for America's working class I mean maybe it works for shareholders it works for the elites but economically it wasn't a great thing for American workers and I would just say in terms of national security you have only to look at what's happening right now with the Nord Stream pipeline to realize that yeah, that, that whole idea of Germany and Russia working together with mutual interests, it didn't fly, right? So that does not guarantee peace just because you're working together and have shared economic interests. So this whole thing about, you know, to use an economic phrase, comparative advantage and how that would be great for economies and for scale and for national security, ultimately what wound up happening is that the U.S. surrendered so much of our intellectual property to China. And in fact, we sort of did that willingly. So many companies were like, here you go, because they were so desperate to be over there. And there was no one minding the store. We we're all like, okay, you know, great. You know, let's have a relationship, a business relationship with China. That was the thinking of the administration. But remember, China has a 100-year plan. And we can barely manage it to figure out the next two years. I mean, we're, we're just trying to say, like, who's going to win in 2024? They're gaming this out. They're systematic. And Ford, meanwhile, the company, I mean, it's like any company. They're pretty simple, right? It's like one big happy golden retriever. It's woohoo, you know, we're going to make money. That's great. That's all we want to do is make money. But it's not that simple because China's smart. And sure, they want to make money too. But this is more than making money to them. It's an opportunity to gain more intelligence on the U.S., to make us more reliant on them. And considering the direction of the world, where we're going, that's not a good idea. So while Ford focuses on business interests in the short term, China is playing the long game, and American taxpayers, we're the ones paying for it. You are paying for this. You, with your tax dollars and this whole green energy push, are actually helping China. So I, I would just ask what I think is pretty obvious, and that's why the heck can't Ford and other American companies, why can't they figure out ways to produce this stuff themselves? Why do you need a joint venture with China? Why not outright purchase the intellectual property if you need it and then improve upon it? Or better yet, why not tap young engineers here in the United States of America to come up with rival products? <laughs> Instead, Biden thinks that somehow this is great. I mean, our energy secretary, give me a break, Jennifer Granholm, who, by the way, is the former governor of Michigan, so she's trying to help her buddies there. She thinks this is outstanding, of course. But here's the reality. It's outstanding for Ford, for the lobbyists, for China, but not for America. China's playing chess. We're playing a bad game of checkers. You know... Um, it's disappointing, <laughs> to say the least. We're, we're clearly not very smart. Uh, and I'll tell you, this administration is certainly not very smart. I will also tell you that there's one little guy out there who would never fall for this, and that is my dog, Fluffy. This is what you call a hard turn in my business, because, you know, we're, we're like all serious, but I want to tell you about one of our 
other wonderful advertisers and it, Fluffy works into this because uh, it's it's centered around him. He's uh, definitely smarter than the government. I know that even though he can't talk. Maybe that's a good thing, actually. <laughs> anyway, it, or maybe it's because I feed him the best supplement on the market, which is called Rough Greens. It's a wonderful, wonderful product. It's made by naturopathic doctor Dennis Black. He's a former Army Ranger. He's a former Vietnam-era helicopter pilot. And Dr. Black is really convinced that we need to do more for all of our pets to make sure that they are healthy. He refers to that pet food on store shelves, much of which, by the way, is from China, as dead food. And in order to make that food come alive for your dog, you need the help of this supplement, the Rough Green Supplement. I sprinkle just a little bit onto Fluffy's food every single night. He absolutely loves it at dinner. And I know, I love it because he's getting all the vitamins, the nutrients, the probiotics, the digestive enzymes, all the things that he needs. So do the same for your dog if you have one. Help your dog look and feel great with Rough Greens. You can actually get your free jumpstart trial bag by going to roughgreens.com forward slash Trish. Roughgreens.com forward slash Trish, my name. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Give it a try. I mean, nothing to lose, right? I think your dog's going to absolutely love it. Roughgreens.com forward slash Trish. Finally, finally, we should probably talk about something happy, right? Or sort of funny. How about the news that Prince Harry's wife, Meghan Markle, is allegedly distraught over her portrayal in the South Park comic um, as a whining, privileged, narcissistic, you know, woke actress who just doesn't get it. Well, now I'm not saying it's easy to be a royal, right? Like, believe me, (laughs) I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a tough gig. And um, I'm sure it's especially hard for her because she's not the star, but that's kind of the way it goes, right? Because, well, she was never going to be the star and she was delusional if she ever thought she would be. Um, Anyway, I I do want to say I applaud the decision by the crown or the firm as it's known to actually encourage future offspring and not encourage, they're telling them, you know, you're going to have to go get a job. So Princess Charlotte is going to have to go get a job. You're not going to be a working royal for the rest of your life. I think that's incredibly healthy, but you know me, I'm a big believer in work and I think people need purpose. And I think part of the problem with what has transpired there is you had the younger brother who was never going to be anything. I mean, look what happened to his uncle. He never had a chance to kind of be his own man. He was just waiting in the wings. And as a result has been quite troubled in many ways. Um, And then you got Meghan Markle who perhaps thought she was smarter than everyone else. Well, she clearly had no idea what she was getting into. And she's reportedly now worried, and by the way, I know this via the Daily Mail because the Daily Mail is all over this story. (laughs) She's worried that um, she won't get the proper placement and appreciation at the coronation ceremony for Prince Charles. I'm sorry, who cares? You gave it up, right? Like you gave it up, it's over and done with. It's weird that, 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 you know, they're out there talking it all out. I would say this is not exactly what you would call British, right? They like to button things up and not spill all their feelings out onto the floor. But, but Harry seems to have lost his way. And I suspect it, it goes back to something that, that I say to young people a lot, which is, look, you know, you can't pick the family that you're born into. But you can pick your spouse. And the most important decision you will ever make in life is who you choose to spend the rest of your life with, who you choose to marry. That is going to have a major impact on your future, perhaps more than anything else. So you need to try and get it right. Choose wisely. Harry did not. I think that's pretty evident, pretty clear right now. Hey, make sure you sign up for the Apple Podcast. Make sure you sign up and subscribe to the YouTube channel to Rumble, and I'll see you back here tomorrow.